we're going to hear first from Kathy Fong. Now, Kathy worked really hard on redistricting reform in California. Some people call her the architect of the redistricting reform there. And so, you know, we are really blessed to have her come and speak with us. She, you know, also is somebody who attend UCLA Law School and has focused on a variety of voting rights and all the different things that we care about. Then we're going to hear from Dan Vicania. Now, Dan uh, writes something that I know you're all going to want to sign up for. It's called the Gerrymandering Gazette. And so I would encourage you all to sign up for that. And then there's Suzanne Almeida. We heard from her before um, talking about, well, you know, what is redistricting and what is district builder and how does community mapping work? In this case, she's going to join us for a little bit more detailed information. Now, you'll remember that um, Suzanne um, worked for the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, our neighbors, um, and she attended Temple University. And so we're glad to have such a wonderful team. This is the redistricting team from Common Cause. Now, the one person who is not included here is Alex. Um, and Alex is actually going to be working on moving the mouse, as, as I was talking about. So she's actually going to be showing you how to actually, there she is, she's waving. So this is Alexandra Leal. Um, Silva, and she is actually going to be the person providing um, the, the, the assistance to the person who's asking the questions or doing the interviews. So that's the Common Cause team. The next team you're going to see, thank you, Alex. Um, the next team you're going to see is from MGGG. Lots of G's, right? Um, and I don't know if you, any of you who know me know that I really struggle with acronyms. It's not my favorite thing in the world. Um, and yet, this is the title. MGGG is the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group. And so first we have Heather. Heather Rosenfeld is the geographer with the MGGG Redistricting Lab. She is also an instructor at Tufts Science, Technology, and Society Program. And then she also has somebody she's working very closely with. Her name is Kat Hennenberg, and she is with the University of Kentucky. She is working on her graduate degree um, in mathematics, and she has been with MGGG for two years. And so those are the folks that are going to walk us through what is community mapping, and how do we use Districter, and what are our next steps. And, and welcome, everybody. I'm going to hand this off right now to my friend, Kathy Fung. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Yay. Okay. Um, I was just playing around with some slides, so I'm not sure if they've gotten into the version that's being shown right now. So hopefully this all works. And if not, we might have to do a little re quick refresh. Um, next slide. So I'm going to be talking about what community mapping is and why it matters. Um, the first thing to understand is the difference between community mapping and districting. And what I, uh, what I like to think of it is, is that uh, community mapping is like trying to figure out the shapes of your Lego blocks, um, um, that you're gonna construct this amazing um, spaceship or uh, gigantic um, 78 room house out of. Um, but each of those shapes is, is slightly different um, and you're gonna use it for different things. Um, districting is when you put all those little blocks together and you create a whole district, right? Um, community mapping is um, really starting at a super local level. Um, courts recognize what communities are um, be, uh, with a legal concept that's called communities of interest. Uh, sometimes it is defined in state constitutions or state statutes. In Ohio, not so much. And so um, you all will be figuring out um, what communities of interest are largely based on self-definition. Um, and we'll get a little bit into that. For districting, for redistricting, when you're drawing the lines of whole districts, you're starting with the basic premise that you've got to follow some very specific rules, right? Um, and those are outlined. And then you're ultimately drawing districts that are of the same size, same number of people, right? Each district, each congressional district has to be exactly the same number of people or as close as possible, the same number of people as the next district. Um, communities can be different sizes, different number of people, um, and they can share different um, aspects um, that bring them together. 
So when I think about communities, I talk about sharing three C's. One is um, similar culture, and culture is a broad term. So it doesn't just mean um, what kind of food you eat, although it could. Um, it could be the kind of uh, traditions that you celebrate, um, but it can also be sort of the things that bring a community together. So if I told you that um, a neighborhood um, really fought hard um, to build a community garden, right? Um, then you know that this is probably some a place that is less rural, probably more suburban or more or more urban, right? And they share a culture around um, trying to create some green space for people. Um, concerns. Um, so concerns is thinking about um, the types of issues that a community has, where over time they have. Uh, really worked to try to um, address those concerns and those shared interests make it important for them to have a candidate um, and ultimately an elected uh, who represents them um, collectively, right? So when you share concerns, um, you have an interest in making sure that you also are able to elect a representative who's listening to those concerns. And the last C is count. Um, so here you're going to look at demographic data. Um, sometimes it is census. Uh, sometimes it'll be uh, other sources. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the most powerful stories about communities are ones where people are identifying um, their, um, in their, um, their stories that you have community leaders actually sharing um, that connection between identity and impact. All right, next slide. Okay, so we should be talking about um, communities. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the slides and I'm looking at it on my cell phone and everything is a little bit covered. Um, so I mentioned before that communities are like building blocks, right? Um, you're going to really try to emphasize lifting up people's stories. Um, those narratives are really important because um, they are a way of taking redistricting um, from just that super political story to something that media can cover and ultimately courts can find compelling because you're really telling how a community is impacted. So you'll remember from previous trainings, the story of Watts where um, they were hit by a freak hailstorm. They were looking to try to get a federal emergency declared. And because they were split into three different pieces, uh, they literally could not dig themselves out of the snow. Um, those are the kinds of stories that you're looking for to explain why when a community is split into different uh, districts, it matters, right? Um, in 2019, the litigation that was brought to challenge Ohio's congressional districts, one of the stories that the court really hung on to was how the county of Hamilton was split. Um, and really what you want to dig into is thinking about why the city of Cincinnati or different communities within Cincinnati really ought to be held together. Otherwise, you don't have the kind of representation that you need. Um, community maps will also be important as those people who are drawing the state district maps, if they're really listening, they're going to think about where the communities are and, and try to respect them. Um, communities of interest can also be used to evaluate the various map proposals that are being put forward. So just like a uh, there is data that you can put forward about how many city splits there are, how many county splits are. So too, you can talk about how, how many community of interest splits there are uh, or where the communities of interest are appropriately held together. So that narrative is super important to talk to the media because you're trying to give them reasons to, to cover this story that aren't just about the cat fight between uh, legislators or parties. Um, and also the courts. Next slide. Let's see if this one worked. Yay, it worked. Okay. So um, this is the community of Long Beach. Um, and this is in Los Angeles, <clears throat> which is where I'm from. So apologize that everybody's got to listen to all of these California stories. Um, but um, 
uh, you, we call this how Long Beach got the boot from the legislature. Um, in 2001, there was an assembly member who was uh, thinking about running for state senate. And as she negotiated with uh, people, you know, whether she was going to be put into District uh, 28, 25, or 27, um, she ultimately decided that she wanted to be in District 28. Um, and they drew her a special accommodation. Um, as you can see, this little boot um, that extends from District 28 uh, to, to include her house. And in doing so, then two other districts had to be drawn around it. Uh, District 25 kind of skirts around it, and then District uh, 27 has to go all the way around um, and get cut off. Um, what, what this impacted was um, the city of Long Beach, which kind of sits on this entire area. So the city of Long Beach ended up getting split three different ways. Um, and then more importantly, where it's highlighted in red, shades of red, the darkest red is where there are, is a significant black community or shades of orange. Um, this community also got split three ways. Um, and so we, we end up with a community that Long Beach, let's talk about culture, has a large African-American and Latinx population, is one of the most diverse cities in the entire country. Um, it has largely working class and middle class families um, with single res family residential neighborhoods um, to throw in the boot if you care, uh, has a large LGBT neighborhood. Um, when those, those communities, particularly communities that are struggling um, because they are already hard hit by things like uh, COVID or um, the impact of the shutdown of the economy, um, they, when they're split three ways, you can imagine that this community has um, an even harder time getting representation or, or responses to their needs, right? So these are the stories that you're going to want to talk, connect culture with your concerns. Now, Long Beach also has a um, two major ports. And from those ports, um, they are a huge source of jobs, but they're also um, the source of, uh, imagine like, several different fingers of freeways that are extending up from those ports in, into um, various parts of California and then, you know, connecting all parts of the U.S. Um, those freeways, because you have 18 wheelers every day, back to back, driving up from the ports, carrying cargo that's shipped from the Pacific, this area has a huge incidence of asthma. Right. So talking about how when you're split three into three different districts, you can't go to your your legislators to get representation about ameliorating major issues like traffic and health. Right. Um, you start to tell a much larger story about why splitting a community into three different districts has an impact on policy decisions. So you're going to want to connect culture concerns. And then the third is count. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see this on the screen, but Long Beach is a city of a 462,000 and change. Um, and one of the statistics is that 15% of the children in this area suffer from asthma, which is twice the rate of the national average, right? So again, connecting statistics with concerns and culture. When you can tell that story, you can start to tell the, the people who are drawing the lines, as well as courts um, and the media, why the lines as they're drawn can, can have a very um, heavy impact on a community and why they need to be changed. I think that's all for me, and I'm just going to hand the baton on to the next speaker. Um, we, we have in here some slides about North Carolina a and Sorry, just skip forward. And North Carolina A&T um, is an HBCU that is split right down the middle of the campus into two different districts. Um, just wanted to show you all some of these communities. It really depends on which uh, place you're at, but whether you're talking about California or North Carolina or Ohio, um, collecting those stories is really important. Thanks. I'm going to hand it on. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about 
how to run a successful mapping session. And Mia, if you'll move to the next slide. I think this is Dan. Maybe he is. Uh... I'm here. Here you go. Okay. Hey, um, so everybody uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the different roles and really dig into the facilitator or interviewer role um, a bit. So uh, as you can see, there's you know different uh, different folks who play a, play a key role in any one kind of community mapping session. Uh, the map maker who really the person kind of holding the mouse is how we always describe that person. The interviewer, like I said, that's a role I'll be digging into. Um, a helper um, who we never know what's gonna pop up um, technology wise or just in terms of the flow of the conversation. Uh, an ambassador, which is more of a public facing uh, role kind of outside of any single one, uh, one session. So uh, to talk a bit about the facilitator, uh, the, the goals are uh, of that person, the interviewer, um, are to help the community group you're working with um, tell a coherent and compelling story about their community. That's gonna be both visually on a map uh, and with written descriptions uh, because the districtor has that both functions. Um, you know, it's to, going to be to define and map the community's boundaries in a really kind of granular way, um, add qualitative descriptions of the community and important landmarks uh, in that community. Uh, and uh, in terms of getting to uh, consensus or to guide the group uh, toward a consensus on all of those fronts. So uh, take a little, a little bit of time to talk about what makes an effective facilitator. Um, First, I think you know it may take uh, some some extra kind of explanation about uh, driving home a difference between community and district mapping, which we got into a little bit. Um, you know, hopefully, I think the training module that uh, we've developed that's been adapted for Ohio folks uh, that defining communities of interest will accomplish this, but it may be need to be reinforced. It may need to be reinforced at other points in the exercise. Um, Really important, you're gonna listen carefully. There's a separate uh, interviewer and district or, you know, kind of map maker uh, for a reason. These are two different roles. Uh, the interviewer should be free to note the clues community members give about the character of that community. Um, you know, multiple, pre multiple people are gonna be describing possibly the same landmarks. So you wanna, you know, keep note of that and you're kind of free to do that um, with somebody else holding the mouse and you taking kind of good notes. Um, uh, there will be a lot of important details are going to help the, that will help the group distinguish the boundaries of their communities from nearby areas. So just you know, making sure you're you're an active listener um, in that process. Um, uh, you know, kind of also included in that and kind of best practices is taking good notes. Uh, people might throw some really useful details at you during the instructions that you know they might not minimize, but it's going to be important to to catch that. You know, they may. Uh, add details in the chat during their verbal reading of their chat comments. What we found in kind of our practice sessions is that um, folks, uh, you know, will read their chat comments and it'll remind them of something that'll kind of add in more flavor. Um, so it's important to keep track of these clues to help you facilitate the discussion. Uh, make sure to ask good questions. Uh, participants might mention one or more landmarks, um, you know, kind of in passing, but really ask them to tell you more about what makes a particular landmark important uh, to give other participants more to discuss when determining whether the group wants to include that um, in, in their presentation, their ultimate presentation um, to decision makers. So really kind of uh, get to the heart of the matter, draw out more details from the, the group that you're talking to. So there's a lot a lot that the uh, participants can really wrestle with and discuss. Uh, spotlight recurring locations and themes. Um, ask the group to discuss whether the repeated mention of a particular landmark means that it should be included in the community map or at least you know, that uh, census block group um, that it's located in should be included in the community map uh, and what impact particular themes about a community may mean for the inclusion of landmarks that aren't mentioned. That might be kind of the, the interviewer's role too to notice that uh, if there are some places that kind of fit a particular description in terms of the character um, of a community, but uh, weren't mentioned explicitly to, to sort of point those out and see if uh, maybe they should be included. Um, finally, land the plane. Um, what we're looking for ultimately is a consensus in the group. You know, seek, seek consensus and help the group get to consensus on whether a particular block group should be included in the community map. Um, give suggestions for language to be used to describe the community on District R's qualitative description section. Um, you know, really you know, leaning on the descriptions that the community folks have given, but kind of help them 
uh, really hone that and determine what, what makes sense in terms of giving a real kind of clear narrative about the community. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, and ultimately what you're trying to do is get, you know, very a, a discreet um, set of census block groups, uh, you know, literally allowing folks to put their community on a map uh, with coherent qualitative description of both the community at large and the individual landmarks to say to decision makers, this is our community, it should be kept together. So um, I think that's kind of the long and short of it, unless, um, uh, you know, Sand or other folks uh, want to chime in. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that um, the some of these, we will be sharing these slides with you. So um, uh, some of those points were also made on uh, some of these slides as well. Um, sure, I can talk a little bit about what a community mapping session looks like. So a lot of you all have um, sat the district our demo that you've heard us talk about it and kind of what we're doing today is on a macro level a good example of how to walk through community mapping session right so these are conversations but these are conversations that need you to set a um set the table before you actually have the conversation right so make sure everyone's on the same page so uh we'll talk a little bit about resources later um, but, you know, generally your flow will look like what is redistricting? Why does it matter? What is the story of you in your community, right? Um, why are we making community maps? You want to make sure everybody's really understands kind of the points. And then we'll go into the actual map making, right? Putting those community points on a map. Um, and then creating that community map using precincts. Something I really want to underline here um, and Dan referenced it at the very top of his presentation is that this is not something that is a one person show, right? So not only is community mapping something that actually takes a community to happen, but it is also the kind of thing that you want to have multiple facilitators, multiple people in the room, one person with them, their hand on the mouse, one person um, with there, you know, who's listening and taking notes and asking questions, right? Because we know that this is a really rich discussion. Um, and we've done a lot of testing, right? The uh, redistricting team has worked through this a number of times in a number of different settings. And one thing that we've really come down to is that it's more than a one person project, right? To do it right and to do it well. So that's why, you know, at the very top of this part of the presentation, Dan talked through all of the different ways you can get involved. And I know that in the chat, there are links for you to sign up. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the Ohio program looks specifically later. Um, but know that there is a role for you either way, right? Like whether you wanna be the tech person, whether you wanna be the question asker, asker, whether you want to be the outreach person, there is a place for you to get involved in this. And this is really the kind of project that's going to take everyone. Um, Alex, if you want to skip ahead a couple slides, I think to the District R folks. There we are. And Hi. I, oh, go ahead, Suzanne. I was just going to toss it to you. It's all you, Heather. Cheers. Um, all right. So it sounds like folks can hear me, but please interrupt if there's any trouble with that. Um, so I am going to talk about using Districtor to map communities and some of our newer features, especially, and then some of our kind of up and coming features. Uh, could you go to the next slide? All right, so Districtor Pre-101. Um, Districtor is a free public mapping tool oriented towards groups like community organizations, uh, in the case of working with y'all, also for state legislatures, for commissions, and um, for anyone who wants to use it. We've worked with some educational groups as well. Um, it was developed by a team of mathematicians, data scientists, software folks, geographers, and a lot of wonderful volunteers um, with a common commitment of fair and open redistricting. We've also partnered um, with a lot of really wonderful civil rights and community groups to build some custom features in, uh, including Common Cause. And so districter.org, thank you, Tiffany. Um, and next slide, please. All right, 
So Districtor has three modes. I'm going to focus primarily on, or Districtor has two and a half modes, let's say. Um, there is districting mode, which is you want to build a full districting plan or a partial districting plan, but you're especially interested in drawing districts. That's not what we're focusing on today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, community mode is where you go to draw communities. Um, you'll see, and Kat will get into more detail on the different options for drawing communities in Ohio, statewide zones and cities. And then, especially for y'all who are doing this uh, ambassador role, uh, next slide, please. We have added event pages and event pages are custom. And so for, yes, we'll be in community mode. Event pages are that two and a half, the variation on, um, on community mode that creates a custom spot for all of your maps. And so event pages in this case, our event tag is Fair Districts Ohio. Um, and there are all the same options for drawing communities as in community mode. And you'll also see at the bottom community submitted maps. And so as folks start submitting their maps with the common event tag, then they will all start appearing there. Uh, later on um, in the next month or so, we'll be developing things like search tools to organize the maps that are submitted. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so for Fair Districts Ohio, there is this event page. So you can go to districtor.org slash event slash Fair Districts OH. Um, you don't need to worry about capitalization in case that's a question. Um, you can also just go to districtor.org in community mode and then enter in your event code when you're saving and sharing. Kat will demonstrate that. Um, and you wanna make sure that you enter in your name or organization. There's a spot for that. And we might be adding information as well where, or we might be adding a, a field as well where we ask people to fill out their county um, just to organize kind of coverage and say, okay, we're missing, um, we're missing the Western third of Ohio. Let's do some more outreach there. Um, uh, so let's get into it. Kat, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Heather. I'm going to share my screen if I can and show you all what this is all about. So um, I saw that Tiffany put districtor.org in the chat. If you navigate to this website, um, we, this is going to be our homepage that you'll see when you get to this website. And the first thing we want to do when we're drawing communities um, is go to the map. And so my favorite way to do that is up here at the top, we have a jump to the map button I'm going to click on. And um, MGGG has landing pages for all 50 states as well as DC and Puerto Rico. But today let's focus on Ohio. So I'm going to click on Ohio right here. And you'll see Heather mentioned there are a couple different modes. And so the first mode that comes up automatically is districting mode, but today we wanna to draw communities. And so if I click on that side, we see a couple different options for Ohio. So in the statewide um, community mode, we have two options for building blocks. We could identify a community using block groups, or we could identify a community um, using precincts. The other modes that we have as well are zones, where you see we have several options for different zones that you could use um, to hone in and draw your community in these areas. And we also have cities listed here as well. Um, and so today I just want to focus on um, demonstrating some of the tools and the features that are really helpful when drawing maps. And so I'm going to um, just do a statewide draw and let's look at precincts today. So as this loads, hopefully it looks a little bit familiar to some people. This looks to me like a lot like Apple Maps or Google Maps. And so hopefully this interface is intuitive at a certain level. Um, right away, some features to note in the top left-hand corner of the screen, we can zoom in and out of our map using the plus and the minus button. 
And we also have this very handy search bar. And so that's gonna allow me to search in a city, a place, um, maybe a landmark that I want to zoom in on or an important place to note for my community. I see Columbus on my map, but I'm not very close to it. So let me search Columbus and see if I could zoom in there. Voila. Okay, some other features to note are on the top right-hand side. So right now, I have selected the hand tool and that's allowing me to click and drag across my screen and move my map with my cursor. The second tool along this toolbar is going to be the landmark tool and that looks a little bit like a teardrop here. So when I click on that, you can see my cursor has turned into a plus sign and that's going to allow me to drop a pin on my map somewhere where there is an important place of interest or a landmark um, that is significant to the community um, where I'm telling a story. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and see if I can't find something that might be a landmark. I see Ohio State University here. I'm going to click down on my screen and add a landmark. So on the right-hand side here, now we have the opportunity to name this landmark and, and very importantly, describe it as well. And so if you are in the um, driver's seat during this portion, that's something that you would want to fill out there. You can add additional landmarks by um, continuing to uh, drop pins on the map using, uh, just by creating a new point, a marker tool there, and we could drop another point if we wanted to. Moving on to the next um, tool in our toolbar up in the right-hand corner, we have a paintbrush. So when I click on that, I can make my paintbrush bigger or smaller. And as I drag my mouse, my mouse across the screen, you'll see that these little building blocks, these precincts are highlighted when I hover over them. And so this is where we're gonna get into actually drawing your community. And so I've dropped my landmark of Ohio State University and now I'd like to cover in some of these blocks that encompass that community um, around this area. Um, and you'll see my brush is a little bit big for how far zoomed out I am. So that is something to be careful about. Um, we wanna make sure that I'm coloring exact, in exactly where I want to. Um, if you'd like to um, add another community, that is going to be this other plus button right upside beside the color. And you'll see my mouse is again highlighting where I'm hovering and I can start to draw another community um, alongside this map. One neat thing about Districtor is that you can um, overlap your communities in this tool. And so um, Perhaps Old State, Ohio Stadium is um, significant to both communities that I'm drawing here. I want to include that uh, precinct in both of these um, communities. Um, again, on the right-hand side, like with the uh, points of interest or the landmark tool, um, this is gonna be where we want to name and again, very importantly, describe our communities. Um, this drop-down tool allows me to toggle between the communities that I've already drawn today. Um, the next tool on this top toolbar, um, as I go along here, is going to be the eraser, um, which is just as important as the drawing tool, right? So perhaps I went a little too far on this yellow, just this yellow community that I drew, and I'd like to erase some of these. It's as simple as um, clicking a, a second time on those precincts. A couple of the things I'd like to highlight um, are the data layers and evaluation um, tabs. So right now we're on drawing, which is when we get to name and describe our communities. Um, if I want to, you could look at um, the data layers, which shows a little bit more about the information we have at this precinct level for um, the precincts that you've shaded in. And so um, this is where you're gonna see some more information about the map in front of you. And the evaluation tab does kind of a cool thing. You can see um, some comparisons between the community that you drew and Ohio as, um, as a state as a whole. 
Um, and then extremely important, after we've done our drawing, after we feel really confident about our map and the information that we've provided, we want to share and save this. So at the top here, we have a share button. And when I click on that, this generates a unique link. And so this URL is something that I would want to copy down and save. Um, and if like Common Cause Ohio, you have an event code um, for your uh, organization, that is where you would enter your Fair Districts Ohio event code. Um, additionally, if you're interested in saving and working on these, um, your map um, independently, uh, you have the option, if you click this in the top uh, right-hand corner, the three bars, um, you have the option to export your community of interest plan as a JSON, um, which would make it compatible with re-uploading it into um, Districtor if you wanted to, um, as well as exporting it as a shapefile that would make it compatible with something like QGIS or ArcGIS software or a CSV, which would make it compatible with something like Excel. Heather, am I missing any demo parts of this? Um, or are there any questions about this um, district or demo that I should address? Um, let's work backwards a little bit before going to the Q&A um, and get to um, Michael's question specifically about the URL. Um, Michael asks, the URL that was just shown, is it temporary or until you save, or is it still available if you start another session? That is probably the most important thing to take away from today in some ways. Um, yes, there's no login or password required. Um, so the URL that is shown is uh, an indefinite permanent URL. It does not go anywhere, however, only you have it unless you enter in that event code. So if you are doing a draft, if you are drafting a map but want to think about it overnight or want to ask your neighbors to look at it, save that URL and then the next day or like in a week or two, open it again, the exact same map will generate. Um, you'll click update. When you update it in a new session, it'll generate a new URL and you'll, you can keep that again. Um, when you are ready to turn your map in, whether that's to Fair Dist Districts Ohio, the event, um, or to a commission directly, enter in that event code um, or share that URL if it's to a commission. Uh, Are you two feeling ready for questions? Um, well, we, we have um, another few slides, but it might make sense to pause for questions right now, yeah. So I thought maybe it would make sense to go, people have asked some simple kinds of questions that I thought maybe it would good to be good to do some review. Yeah. Um, and so I, I know you just went through the how and where I can save my map. Um, the question is, why is it important to put that event code in? Yeah, so the reason to put the event code in is so that in this case, Fair Maps Ohio can see all of the maps and can organize all of the maps. And so let's say, so we're working across the state of Ohio. And so one thing that we're interested in is good coverage. And part of that is reaching marginalized and hard to reach communities. And so we might see, okay, we have 200 maps for this part of Ohio, but we have two maps for this other part of Ohio. That's where we need to do more outreach. Um, so things like that are a reason to put them there. Um, another so reason, Oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, so this one connected a little bit, which was, can I find other saved maps that people have made? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Um, can we go back a few slides? I think just, let's see, one more slide. Yeah. Um, or yeah, the what can you do with district or event page. So you see start drawing your community. That's what Kat did a demonstration of um, from the main communities page. And then community submitted maps. Right now there is a sample made by the P 
PI of the redistricting lab, Moon. Um, we are hoping and expecting community submitted maps to become uh, vast uh, and be an area where you can see where a lot of people have put maps already. Um, in the future, this is uh, over the next month or so, we'll be developing things like how can you search the community submitted maps by region, how can you sort them, things like that. So this question really had to do with like, and you spoke briefly about this, about how communities overlap. And the question really has to do with, you know, what if there is a disagreement about communities and how does an interviewer or mapper handle that? Yeah, um, that is a great question. And the answer is ultimately going to be, it depends, but there are a few things that you are gonna wanna consider. Um, one is that different communities can absolutely overlap. That's what happens in reality. Um, the thing to take into consideration is whether it might benefit their interests, those common interests to be served by being in a single district. And in that case, you might want to take those community maps that are overlapping, bring them into Districter. This is a feature that we'll be rolling out in the next couple of weeks. Um, bring community maps into Districter and then draw a sample map where those communities are in the same district. Um, in cases where people are saying the same community or drawing the same community and saying, well, no, the boundary stops at Broadway. And then another person saying, no, the boundary stops at Main Street. Um, in those cases, it depends. If you have the opportunity to be working um, with a community organization and get to consensus and say, well, this is why I think this, this is, but maybe there aren't people, um, living between Broadway and Main Street. And so then that area might not be part of the community of interest because they're um, based on where people live. Uh, and in other cases, you might have um, a disagreement that's either harder to resolve or just two people are submitting separate maps. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you have both of those options um, when um, the redistricting lab is going to be doing a lot of mapping and analysis. Um, I'm sure common causes also, and I think we're going to be working together on some of that, um, of these overlaps uh, uh, within and between communities of interest. And that can influence um, both uh, whether communities are split and whether communities are merged. And um, it might be ideally um, you're drawing districts, you don't have to split any communities except the ones that are so huge that it makes sense to split them. Um, you can merge the communities that it makes sense to merge. Um, I feel like uh, not especially bad case, but getting in like the making hard decisions case would be that you uh, need to balance population and therefore can't include all of a community in one district. And so maybe you include the consensus area, but not the area that didn't get consensus. So that's where that data can be helpful. So this was from Matthew. He, he said, basically, we understand that Fair Districts Ohio is the event code or the code or tag for all of our maps in general. What if you wanted your own event code what would you do? You should get in touch with us and we can make you a new event code. Um, is that, I, I also want to respect that Common Cause is running this training. Um, if you want folks to go through you, that is totally fine also. Well, I think there is a real benefit in all of us being able to share our work product so that the mm -hmm. map can have a conversation about one another or about each other and with each other. Um, on the other hand, I think whole notion of saying, okay, I, I would, I want my own event code. I, that I told, uh, I feel free. Okay. So this is the next um, kind of question that we got. Can you explain a little bit about why it's important to put the verbal explanations along with the maps? Yeah. So that is where a lot of what uh, the first half of the presentation um, 
where we connect the pieces, um, where what Kathy was saying and what Anne was saying about getting that cultural narrative. Um, because one, um, at a, in a really simple way, people might title their communities differently. And so if you don't have that narrative, you don't know that they're at all the same. Um, Another thing is that we want to know what the common interests are. And that is because we're not ultimately be going to be, I mean, I say we, but I'm not the one drawing districts. District drawers are not going to be saying, okay, you get a district and you get a district and you get a district, one for each community. Um, we're going to be thinking about, uh, again, that we out there that I want to help influence in a good way. Um, are going to be thinking about which communities it makes sense to merge and which communities it makes sense to keep whole but not merge. Um, and so that's where those common interests, uh, those narratives can be helpful. So hey, this is Kathy, can I jump in? Oh, please, Kathy, jump in. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things that may end up happening is that uh, you might have people who are putting forward communities of interest um, who aren't really from that community or who are really just trying to mimic the set of voters who really like one incumbent. <laughs> so they're putting themselves forward as a community, but they're not, but you know, it could be just a person in the back room. The more detail that you give or are able to generate about that community um, with community input, the more legitimate it is that you could sort of establish this is a real thing, right? Um, when I told about sort of the city of Long Beach, yeah, it's a city, but that doesn't necessarily mean all those people share the same interests. So then you need to start talking about kind of where are their populations, what's the culture, you know, things like do a little bit of extra research, right? After you have the conversation, um, when I looked up Long Beach Health, just literally just Googled it, I was able to find basic information about how, you know, there's higher incidence of asthma, higher incidence of um, uh, diabetes. Those kinds of stories start to then tell you a little bit more about how this area, you know, that we're pointing out is a community because they share similar kinds of concerns. And that story, that narrative is really important because otherwise what's going to happen is there may be somebody who puts forward a totally illegitimate community of interest description. And how do you make the distinction between uh, this set of lines and that set of lines is that additional detail. We have a really kind of specific question about landmarks, um, specifically how to select and pin landmarks and what if the landmark isn't there already? Um. If it makes sense, we can go back into a screen share and Kat can- It might make yeah. sense because that one's fairly specific. Yeah. Uh, um, would you be willing to repeat the question? So basically it, it's like, how do you use the landmark function on the maps, but also what if a landmark that you know is there isn't there and how do you make it a landmark? Yeah, good question. Okay, very importantly. So um, one way that you can find those landmarks um, would be by typing in the search bar. Um, so that's granted if, uh, that landmark would show up, say, on Google Maps or Apple Maps. Um, and so something like uh, this stadium, which I can see is already a landmark. Um, let's see. I can zoom in on that by clicking, by searching in the toolbar and searching like that, um, adding a landmark just by using, um, I'm on the landmark tool, I have selected, um, I want a new point. Um, hopefully it um, 
you can click on this and there will be a plus button and you can drop that pin on. Oh, it is working. I, for some reason, just couldn't see it. It was behind the blue um, dot. So I'm going to do it right beside here. Um, and um, so the other part of the question was that if this doesn't, if maybe your, your landmark doesn't um, exist on this map, it's not something that you could zoom in on easily. Um, my suggestion would be to, to uh, locate that using um, surrounding area. Um, if I know that it's near a corner um, of two streets, I can search streets easily um, using this tool. Um, and so maybe using some context clues within the community to, um, to locate something that isn't explicitly on um, this geographical map. Um, Heather, I don't know if you have any other suggestions on um, how that might be. Yeah. First, just echoing Constance posted this, um, streets would absolutely be logical landmarks. Um, and a lot of the, the rest of it, if it's not already on the map, then a lot of that is like what Kat said of turning to that local community-based knowledge um, where people are going to know where the important places are. Um, one thing to note is that while the narrative in the areas of interest, which are the community of interest maps themselves, um, or the community of interest areas, uh, are the narrative there is in a bunch of ways the core narrative. Uh, if in if a specific landmark is important um, and defines the community as part of what defines the community, then that's where you would add that point rather than simply saying, "Oh, Ohio Stadium already shows up." Um, Jesse Owens Plaza already shows up, but maybe one of them is more important to the community's concerns. And so that's where you would add a little bit. Um, one uh, interview that I did with someone in Georgia talked about um, a hospital that was a major employer. And then the hospital decreased in size and is in some ways, uh, the cause of unemployment in the area. And so adding that detail um, is what enriches the community map. Heather, um, here's, a, here's a question about naming conventions. OK, so, so we talked about the event code. Um, are there naming conventions, for example, I don't know, Franklin County or um, a specific city? Uh, there are not naming conventions right now. We are um, in the field where you enter in, the fields where you enter in the information, um, there's the event code, and then there's the uh, community name or organization name. And um, if you're an individual, we ask you to enter your name there or an organization. Um, if you're mapping one specific community, it can be helpful to enter in that community as well. Um, we are probably going to be adding in a field or two that asks for more information so that we can code this better. Um, however, um, fortunately, since we're working with maps and geographic information, we can pull that information from a map because you'll be, I don't actually know what county Ohio State University is in, but uh, the map does. So we can pull that information and use that to organize the maps later on. Well, and Susan has a good question. And could a school district or an elementary school be a landmark? Yeah, so we, I would say um, that a school could be noted as a landmark. Um, and in one of the demonstrations that we've done, we've had schools as landmarks. Um, I would say a school district is more of an area that might be part of your community or overlapping with your community. Um, and if there's interest, we could add, and we've added this in a few other states, um, school districts for people to see them. I think we've added it to part of Ohio. All right, well, Michael had a question that I thought was a good one. Um, like how long does it generally take when you're doing one of these sessions you know, you know, how long should should someone plan for this kind of community mapping session? Oh gosh, this is also an it depends answer. And I also, um, I can't answer this, but I suspect that Kathy 
and Dan can do an even better job answering this, so I'll be brief um, and say, uh, if you're being really concise um, and the people have, a, and you're only working with a few people, it might be 15 minutes minimum. I would also say if you're working with like a larger group, especially like an hour to build a solid community map. Well, that, that completely makes sense. So Gary had a question. He, he said that he was the district R, and this has to do with the other side of the mapping, is about 178 people short for the state of Ohio. Is there a timetable for updating it? Yeah. So I am, so it is currently based on 2010 decennial census data. And uh, as a lot of folks who work with census data know and are a little bit in agony about the 2020 data release is being delayed and then delayed and might be in the fall, hopefully, probably. Um, once it's there, we'll add it. Um, in the meantime, we are starting to add and I would say within the next month, um, we are started we that we will have added it um, to all the states that we're working with the 2019 ACS data. The issue is that that's an estimate. It's not a complete count. Um, there are more issues of uncertainty, um, and uh, so there's that. But yes, uh, it is off. So there is census data that is more recent, but it is not the complete count of everyone. It is an estimate of a small percentage of the population. But that's what we're looking at adding. Well, Don wanted to know if he could import something that's already been mapped. Uh, yes, and um, we, if you go to in Districtor, um, we have a um, some bars at the top, um, the option of jump to the map, the options of about Districtor. Um, we will soon be adding. Um, some information on imports and exports. Um, so I'm going to summarize it, but an option to view that again coming soon. Um, so you can import a JSON file. So if you exported a JSON from district or you can just import it back in. Um, the same with a CSV file. Um, and the same with, of course, the link, if you exported a link. Um, other files. Uh, not so much. Um, if you really need to import another file, then we can we can talk about that, and I'm sure we can figure out a way. So he, I have one more question about Districtor. Um, this one is very simple, but it, it, is there a login or password required? Nope. No login. No password. Truly open. All right, I've gone through almost all the questions. There are a couple of questions that are about how does community mapping fit in with redistricting, fit in with districtor, which I thought that we would do at the end. Um, and I'm gonna actually hand this over to Mia. So if you still have a question that I did not hit, you can add it again into the chat, just you know, so I, in case I somehow missed it. Um, but, but we'll do, be doing a few more questions um, after we hear from Mia. And Mia Lewis from Cause, Ohio. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. Yeah, so this is so great and it's so cool that we have all these people participating. Um, of course, redistricting is happening all across the country, but here in Ohio, we are kind of forging ahead um, of a lot of other states because we have all of you guys who are so like interested in participating. So we are kind of a little bit, um, just a warning, we're a little bit building the plane as we are flying it. So some of the things that I'm gonna describe in the next couple of slides, like we're just trying them out and we're going to see how they work um, and hopefully, um, you know, get this up and running for everyone. And there, there really have been a lot of great questions in the chat and we will make sure any that we can't answer at the end here, we will try to answer in some kind of blog post or something. We also will send you a lot of materials for our follow up tomorrow, including a recording of the January 25th map making training that we did that Suzanne led with our friends Ifeolu and Michael where they did a demonstration of a community mapping session for Shaker Heights and that was really helpful to see kind of what that interview process is where you you ask about the community and then you write down the descriptions and all of that so if you didn't happen to be able to attend that we will send a recording of that as well 
Okay, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna ask you to do, just as we did, I know a lot of you guys are in our speakers bureau as well, just as we did for the speakers bureau, we're gonna ask you to sign up to be map makers. And on the sign up form, and Tiffany will, will drop um, the, the link in the chat there. Um, <clears throat> on the sign up form, you'll be able to say whether you wanna do the software part or you wanna do the interviewing part, or you wanna just be an ambassador who's out there in the world um, trying to find groups um, that will, um, uh, that will you know, that are interested in having maps drawn for them. So if you can sign up for this, a question that I should, that I was realizing during this presentation that I should have added that I didn't was, um, are you okay having your information shared with others in, who are also map makers? Because if we wanna have more than one person work on maps together, it will be nice to be able to like, get you guys linked up with each other. So I'm just gonna assume, yes, you can sign up for multiple roles. That's awesome. We're very happy for you to do that. Um, I'm going to assume that you guys are okay with having your um, information shared unless you um, tell me that you aren't. Um, uh, because, you know, um, I think that that is seems um, reasonable. Um, so that's your sign up form. Next slide. And then um, we want to make sure that you have a chance to practice. So our buddy Trevor, who's um, on the on the uh, the Zoom here with us, we've uh, set up some practice times, um, and they're groups of ten, so that everyone has um, uh, you know plenty of access to the trainer. So this is Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at eleven, and Wednesdays at seven p.m. And um, if you go to the Sign Up Genius, you can sign up. Um, you know, for one or more sessions. And then we hope that while you're in those sessions, you know, he can walk you through all of this stuff about saving and naming conventions and sharing and all that stuff that, you know, is, is really important. Um, and you can also maybe make some connections and say, hey, do you, do you want to make maps with me? Um, or do you want to practice again with me? Um, because I think you may want a couple of of practice sessions. So we'll fill up all of these sessions. If they all get full, then we can add some more um, and let us know if you have any questions about that. And of course you can, yes, this will all be sent out in the email tomorrow, um, all of these links and all of these things. And you can, you know, you can go to the software anytime, of course, and practice um, whenever you like. Okay, so next slide. Um, our next thing is figuring out how we, um, we part, pair you up with the groups that want maps made. So we created a spreadsheet here, which has um, where people can write down that they represent a group of people who want to have a map made for them. And you can add this, the edit, the link that we're sending out here is an edit link. And you can add either information about groups that you know, you're involved with, communities that you think might wanna have a map made, a contact person, or you can add your name to say that you're interested in working with them to create the map. And actually we, we need some help here because if we wanna cover all of Ohio and make community maps for all of Ohio, um, then we need some help um, figuring out groups and individuals and, and you know, that, that want to have um, maps made for them. So that's a, a sign up there. Um, next, next, uh, yeah, churches, community groups. So you can tell that we're still working on some of the some of the things like having um, tags for counties or having you know enhanced ways of of searching for things, etc. Eventually, we hope to have some kind of map. You know, it'll happen in the next month or weeks or whatever, some kind of map where we can identify the areas that we've already had maps made for um, and so that we can try to spread out to some additional areas. We know that there will be a lot of maps of Shaker Heights and a lot of maps of Clintonville and a lot of maps of you know the short north, but we want to make sure that we get out um, past that and we cover more areas. Um, uh, you know, because we're empowering the communities to speak about you know their part, their community in an 
and link the words with a picture so that when we see the maps that the officials have come out with, we will be able to identify, well, you know what, I can see just looking at that map that it cuts my community in half. Or, you know, I can see looking at that, that, um, you know, it's doing this weird thing with this, with this thing that I call my community. So as many parts of the state as we can cover, um, the better. And then I just have one last um, slide and one last request. So um, you guys are all amazing and um, we rely on you for so much. Um, the district or team, um, you know, in Ohio, each of our 88 boards of elections kind of run separately and they are in charge of a lot of stuff. And they are in charge in Ohio of creating the precincts, the voting precincts that make up our cities and townships and counties. And that information, if you wanna get precinct level, if you wanna get information about what the precincts are in each county, you have to ask each county. And if we're actually gonna create maps that will actually be useful in the end, I mean, they're all useful, but more useful in terms of putting them together to create districts. It would be really, really, really helpful for us to have information about um, all the precincts in each county and you know what precincts are involved in this city and what precincts are involved in this township. But that has to be done by communicating with each county separately. So we created a sign up sheet for those of you who might be willing to help us to communicate with each county and ask them for precinct level data. Um, so if you're willing to do that, basically in the yellow, you put your name first and last name in your email and you sign up for the counties that you're interested in contacting. We will give you some additional information as to who was contacted in that county before and in what format they gave us the data, but that will really help us um, to just kind of bring these maps up to another level of, of usefulness. Um, so that's the end of what I have to say and I'm going to turn it over to um, Suzanne. Great. Um, so I am only going to take a couple minutes, but I want to talk quickly first about just the timeline because we know things are shifting and second about some of the resources. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to everyone who is on at 8 11 uh, Eastern time, which is fantastic because this is a lot of work and a lot of information coming at you. So as Heather mentioned, um, our uh, the delivery of census data is going to be delayed. The Census Bureau has announced that they will get apportionment data out to the president um, by April 30th, which is about four months, uh, three months after it's typically out, no, four months after it's typically out. And the redistricting data will be delivered at the moment uh, by September 30th. Again, that particular date is subject to change as things get um, filled in. So what this means, can you go to the next slide, please, Alex, is that in Ohio, right, we know that there is a there are a series of deadlines, both for the congressional and legislative maps. Um, the first legislative map is due uh, September 1st, and the first congressional map is due uh, September 30th. Keep in mind, I know that there are a lot of intermediate dates, but these are, you know, some basic parameters so we all have a baseline understanding. Obviously, if we're not going to get redistricting data until September 30th, those dates aren't going to work, right? And so there are some options, some good options or better options, and then some absolutely unacceptable options um, as we're looking at kind of the spectrum of possibilities. So there are two things that could happen that are not good, right? One is that the map makers use bad data or old data. Uh, so they use ACS data, American, uh, American Community Survey, excuse me, uh, data that would be, again, like Heather said, just an estimate, which is not gonna give us what we need when we're drawing districts because we know that there are specific rules that districts have to follow. The other would be to hold an election using old data, old Ohio lines. That also doesn't make any sense, right? We know that Ohio's population has grown and changed and people have moved around. And so if we want truly representative districts where people can elect uh, representatives that share their lived experience or at least are there, um, have an opportunity to elect folks who um, are their choice of a representative, then we can't be using old data. 
So what does that leave us? That leaves us with moving these dates, right? So moving the constitutional deadlines as far as when the maps are due, it also probably or possibly means moving the candidate filing deadline or the primary. All of that to say, the most important thing that we can do right now as we're getting more information about what the timeline is going to look like, I know that there are discussions with the legislature. I know the Ohio Common Cause team is like up to their eyeballs, figuring out what's going to happen next. What we can do, what you all can do is start collecting those data points, which are community maps, right? Because communities don't have to be based on current census data. They are just a story of where you are or where a community is and what makes that place itself, right? Those three C's that Kathy talked about way back at the beginning of the presentation. And so that's why it's so important that we're talking about that community mapping as a first step. Um, and we've seen this delay in census data as an opportunity really to get all of that data we need, data points as community maps, all of that data we need to have good representative maps at the end of this whole process. So that's the timeline really quick. Uh, Alex, can you flip to the next slide? So just really quickly, tools and resources. There's been lots and lots of questions in the chat and I really appreciate all of the eagerness that you all have to get started. So you're going to get copies of old recordings, right? So you'll see the whole district or demo that I did a month ago. Uh, you're gonna get a copy of these slides. You're gonna get a copy of this recording. You're gonna get a community mapping slide deck with a proposed script, right? So it walks you through start to finish. You don't have to create your own uh, slide deck. It has a script in there. So it's really easy for you to just kind of take it, make it your own. People will get a frequently asked questions. You're gonna get a facilitator's guide that goes through the tips and tricks that Dan laid out, right? How to listen, how to ask questions, how to take good notes. You know, the fact that we wanna have um, more than one person managing a session, right? The fact that there are different rules that you can do. And then we have a set of, um, call them our 10 one pagers, we need a better name for them, but essentially they're in-depth one pagers that give you kind of the basics that you need to know about why redistricting matters, what community mapping is, what the VRA is, what, how do you get involved, how do you organize your community. It gives you kind of this toolkit that you can bring along with you um, to these presentations. So you're going to have all of this stuff and you will have obviously access to me, Mia, Catherine, Trevor, Tiffany, the whole shebang, right? Um, if you have questions, right? We're trying to give you what you need um, and I do want to underline what Mia said, we're a little bit building this plane as we're flying it, which is thrilling and terrifying, and we are so thankful that you all are along for the ride. So with that, I will turn it back over to Catherine. All right, so I have a question that I think is good for the Common Cause team. It really is, how do, do the community maps fit in with the whole redistricting process? In other words, why do we make community maps? Catherine, you 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 should answer it. <laughs> Isn't or that hilarious? Someone. Well, I will start it. I just thought that it would make sense for uh, Suzanne and um, and Dan to talk a little bit about this, or maybe Kathy. You know, one of the things that's really clear to me is that there are rules about keeping communities together. Um, but sometimes communities are going to have to be divided because of population. And sometimes, you know, a county is going to have to be divided. Sometimes a city is going to have to be divided. What we want to do is make sure that we have good data so that when those maps overall are divided, that we know where those communities are. And it isn't always as easy as the pol political subdivisions or the units. And you know, making sure that people are engaging and, you know, what it, what is it that I want? I, I want to have, for example, I want to have my school district completely together, or I want to make sure that when they divide this, and this becomes really important when you think about school, when, it, when you start to think about um, state house districts, because there are 99 of those rather than, you know, the 16 or 15 congressional districts, thinking about those communities becomes even more important. 
This is also a wonderful opportunity to engage other Ohioans in, well, why do we care about these maps? We care about these maps because we care about our communities and we care about voting. Um, and that's how it's all, con it's all connected. And I, I'm just really pleased that we're here together um, making some maps and having a conversation about where we want to see Ohio go. Um, and, and I was going to say, Suzanne, do you want to jump in here? I mean, I think you covered it, right? This is data that's going to tell us. We know that there are you know, technical definitions of what a community of interest is. We know that there are efforts uh, generally to make sure that either our single communities or you know, multiple communities are kept together. It really goes back to being able to tell that story, right? So the way I look at it is the redistricting process is going to happen with or without this data. The redistricting process with this data means that the map makers are seeing what everyday Ohioans are defining as their community. Not only defining, but giving them an actual map with landmarks and boundaries, right? And so that's gonna ultimately feed into that map making process. And it allows us uh, to have what I call is like an evaluative tool, right? We can look at what comes out of those, of the commission and say, does this match what we have said we need as community members, right? And so like, you know, it's, again, it's data, it's part of telling the story, it's part of engaging in a process. Well, and I don't know if you noticed, but Mosey um, said, hey, we can use these when it comes time to go testify at the state house. Um, I think that's, that's important as we're thinking about these maps, being able to go in and have a conversation, not just you know saying it, but actually showing, hey, I actually want to have my community kept together. Here it is. This is what it actually looks like. All right, we have just a few more questions and I realize I didn't get to everybody's tonight, um, but I thought this one was an important one. How many citizens should you actually get together for a mapping session? So I have a recommendation on that. I'm assuming that the MPD team might also have a recommendation. Um, so we recommend no more than 15 to 20 folks in a room, right? Or in a Zoom room because you want to be able to have a real conversation. Um, and I, for the same token or on the low end, I wouldn't go fewer than three or four, because again, you want to have that conversation. And we know that if it's just one person sitting in a room making a map for themselves, that's not really community mapping. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I know that other questions popped up. We are gonna keep in touch. Please sign up for a session with Trevor. Um, because I know that um, it, it's definitely helpful to have a conversation about all of these kinds of things. I wanted to say thank you all for coming and participating this evening. I just, I'm so happy to see all of these wonderful map makers and redistricting reformers. And thank you all. Thank you so much. And before you know it, you'll get a bunch of material from us. And thank you again.